Hello everyone, and welcome to Orthodox Shahada. I'm Kai, and this presentation is about Al-Kitab, the book, in which I examine Muhammad's basic understanding of the Torah and Gospel as revelatory kitab in connection to his own self-delusion as being a prophet in continuation of that revelatory tradition. The word kitab is derived from the Arabic root kaf ta ba, which primarily has the connotation of writing in general, but can also be understood to connote dictating, prescribing, appointing, ordaining, making obligatory, judging, passing sentence, decreeing, bringing together, conjoining, and binding. Within the context of divine revelation, kitab has a variety of possible meanings, all related to each other. The straightforward meaning is often understood as book, specifically what you get as the result of writing. Now, you can have a physical compilation of writing, and this compilation, although correctly referred to as book, is also describable with another Arabic word, mushaf. The idea behind mushaf is that this word always denotes a physical book, something that is tangible. Most Muslims will understand mushaf as referring specifically to the Qur'an in written form, but the word itself just simply means a collection of sheets bound together to form a codex. But book can also refer to a sort of heavenly writing. A heavenly book, by its very nature, is not something tangible. Rather, it is a kind of prototype to what is expressed in physical form with a mushaf, or recited orally as revelation from God. Kitab can also simply mean writing or something that is written, and in this sense is very closely related to the root kaf ta ba itself. Kitab in this sense does not have to mean a compilation like a mushaf. It could be writing such as rock inscriptions, for example. The point is simply the idea of conveying a message through the act of writing. Kitab can also refer to divine revelation in general, and more specifically, divine authority, decree, guidance, relationship, or prescriptive nature of revelation. The strand that unites all the various understandings of Kitab is that there is a purposeful conveyance of communicable information or imposition of something from God to humanity. It is more broader than just the act of revelation itself. All too often, Muslim apologists deceitfully restrict or manipulate the meaning of kitab so as to not permit a physical book, a mushaf. They also take the notion of a heavenly kitab to a priori preclude any notion of some kind of physical delimitation. In reality, though, Muslim sources are quite comfortable in permitting physical kitab, but Muslim apologists don't like to admit it because it becomes detrimental to their polemic. Not only that, the reality is that Muslim sources even recognize that a heavenly kitab can itself be physically delimited. As Orthodox Christians, we don't disagree in principle that kitab can have the range of possible meanings I enumerated. In fact, Christ left us with an indisputable physical kitab, his church, a visible body that is the congregation of Christians possessing an authoritative ecclesiastical structure which functions by divine decree and is at all times guided by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the church that Christ himself established is in a perpetual state of being kitab. And this church functioned before the various gospel accounts were compiled, along with the rest of the New Testament scripture as we know it. Nevertheless, the church recognizes that scripture accurately reflects the teachings of Christ and the truthfulness of the gospel message. So not only is the oral gospel that Christ preached kitab, but so too are the later physical written accounts. Contrary to what Muslims would like everyone else to believe, 
the Quran was indisputably a physical scripture at the time of Muhammad. The idea that the Quran only came into written form at the time of Uthman is absolute nonsense and rubbish. What Uthman did was perhaps standardize the text of the Quran, but he in no way was the first to have the Quran committed to writing. Consider what we read in the following hadith from Sahih Muslim. Quote, Anas bin Malik reported, Abu Bakr led them in prayer due to the illness of the Messenger of Allah, of which he died. It was a Monday, and they stood in rows for prayer. The Messenger of Allah drew aside the curtain of Aisha's apartment and looked at us while he was standing, and his, i.e. the Prophet's, face was as bright as the paper of the holy book. And then the remainder of the Hadith. The Hadith says that Muhammad's face was like the paper of the holy book. In the Arabic, the word Mus'haf is used. So Muhammad's face looked in complexion like the pages of a Mus'haf. In other words, the Qur'an existed in physical form when Muhammad was alive. And since the Qur'an is Kitab, the Kitab given to Muhammad existed in physical form while he was alive. Consider also another hadith from Sahih Muslim. Quote, Abu Sa'id Khudri reported that Allah's Messenger said, Do not take down anything from me, and he who took down anything from me except the Qur'an, he should efface that and narrate from me. And then the remainder of the hadith. In this hadith, we clearly see that Muhammad did not forbid the writing down of the Qur'an. What he did forbid was the writing down of other than the Qur'an, for example, hadith. So Muhammad was well aware that the Qur'an was in physical form while he was alive. And since the Qur'an is kitab, the kitab given to Muhammad existed in physical form while he was alive. Consider now a hadith narrated by Zayd bin Thabit himself, a personal scribe to Muhammad. Now, this is a bit of a lengthy hadith, so please bear with me, but there are several important points it raises. Quote, Narrated Zayd bin Thabit, Abu Bakr sent for me owing to the large number of casualties in the battle of Al-Yamama, while Umar was sitting with him. Abu Bakr said to me, Umar has come to me and said, A great number of Qaris of the Holy Qur'an were killed on the day of the battle of Al-Yamama, and I am afraid that the casualties among the Qaris of the Qur'an may increase on other battlefields, whereby a large part of the Qur'an may be lost. Therefore, I consider it advisable that you, Abu Bakr, should have the Qur'an collected. I said, How dare I do something which Allah's Messenger did not do? Umar said, By Allah, it is something beneficial. Umar kept on pressing me for that till Allah opened my chest for that for which he had opened the chest of Umar, and I had in that matter the same opinion as Umar had. Abu Bakr then said to me, Zaid, You are a wise young man, and we do not have any suspicion about you, and you used to write the divine inspiration for Allah's messenger. So you should search for the fragmentary scripts of the Qur'an and collect it in one book. Zaid further said, By Allah, if Abu Bakr had ordered me to shift a mountain among the mountains from one place to another, it would not have been heavier for me than this ordering me to collect the Qur'an. Then I said to Umar and Abu Bakr, How can you do something which Allah's messenger did not do? Abu Bakr said, By Allah, it is something beneficial. Zaid added, So he, Abu Bakr, kept on pressing me for that until Allah opened my chest for that for which he had opened the chests of Abu Bakr and Umar. And I had in that matter the same opinion as theirs. So I started compiling the Qur'an by collecting it from the leafless stalks of the date palm tree and from the pieces of leather and hides and from the stones and from the chests of men who had memorized the Qur'an. I found the last verses of Sirat al-Tawbah, Verily, there has come unto you an apostle Muhammad from amongst yourselves. 
from Khuzaimah or Abi Khuzaimah and I added to it the rest of the surah. The manuscripts of the Qur'an remained with Abu Bakr till Allah took him unto him. Then it remained with Umar till Allah took him unto him. And then with Hafsa bint Umar. End quote. What we see from this hadith is that the Qur'an was not only being written down during the lifetime of Muhammad, but being written down specifically for Muhammad, without precluding it being written down by others. Also, while the Qur'an was indeed in physical form during the lifetime of Muhammad, it wasn't collated together all in one place as a single physical book. It was now the monumental task for Zayd to go about compiling it into a single physical book. And the Hadith demonstrates that that's exactly what happened. In other words, the Qur'an, the kitab given to Muhammad, could be assembled in part from existing physical writings. Whatever didn't yet exist in physical form could be obtained from oral recitation and set down in writing. In other words, the kitab known as the Qur'an came to be a single bound physical book during the first caliphate, i.e. within two years of Muhammad's death. Two years because Abu Bakr succeeded Muhammad to become the first caliph, and his reign was just only slightly more than two years. No one would deny that the Qur'an that existed in physical form while Muhammad was alive, or that was compiled into a single physical complete book within two years of his death, was kitab. It may not be kitab in the sense of the original form as first heavenly and then secondly as earthly recitation. Nevertheless, it was kitab in the truest sense of the word. The mushaf that Zayd compiled was for all intents and purposes kitab. As kitab, Muslims would show it reverence when it was handled much like how Muslims today display etiquette towards handling a modern mushaf. There is not a single Muslim who can say that the mushaf compiled by Zayd was not kitab, and at that same time not look like a complete fool. It may not be the original form of kitab, but it was an accurate and faithful reproduction of kitab, and as such, it is also kitab. I used three hadiths to establish that the kitab we know as the Qur'an was a physical mushaf that existed during the lifetime of Muhammad. Now let's take a look at a commentary to the Murshid al muin The Murshid al muin is a classical standard book of the Maliki Madhab used for centuries to train scholars and jurists. The basic text is written in a rhythmic style to help students memorize it, which they readily do, as a summary of what the Maliki Madhab teaches. Basically, if one is a Maliki jurist, then it's expected that one can recite the text from memory. The text encapsulates the core ideas of Ashari Kalam, Maliki Fiqh, and Junaidi Tasawwuf, or Sufism. The Murshid al muin has been the subject of copious commentaries throughout the centuries. Rejection of this text basically amounts to rejection of the Maliki Madhab itself. That's how central the text is to the Maliki Madhab. Obviously, it's not the only text of importance for the Maliki Madhab, and there are others that are treated in higher regard, for example, the Mukhtasar of Khalil, the Mudawana, and the Muwatta. Nonetheless, the Murshid al muin is a valued, indispensable gem for those who follow the Maliki Madhab. The portion of the commentary I want to highlight is the following. Quote, Iman is unwavering trust in Allah, the books, the messengers, the angels, the imminent raising up of mankind, the decree, the sirat bridge, the balance, the fountain of the prophet, the garden, and the fire. As for Ibn Ashr saying, and the books, 
Ibn Hajar al-Haytami says that they refer to the speech of Allah, exalted is he, from before endless time, that is, speech disconnected from letters and sound. It refers to the fact that Allah, exalted is he, revealed the books to his messengers by way of in-time contingent speech on the tablets or on the tongue of an angel, that all that they contained came into being and proved true, that some of the judgments contained in them were abrogated and some not. Azamakhshari said they comprise 104 books, 50 of which were revealed to Shaith, 30 to Idris, 10 to Adam, 10 to Ibrahim, and then the Torah, the Injil, the Zabur, and the Furqan, the discrimination, i.e. the Qur'an, end quote. Now, there's altogether the side question of what exactly are the 10 books given to Adam and the 10 books given to Ibrahim, but the more pressing point I want to draw everyone's attention to is how kitab can be given by the tongue of an angel, as is the Islamic claim that Jibril gave the Qur'an to Muhammad, or, and I'm emphasizing or, kitab can be given on tablets. Notice how the tablets are not given by an angel. They are presumably given by Allah directly. And what are the tablets? They are the tablets that were given to Moses directly. And I want to stress this point. Directly. There were no angelic intermediaries in giving the tablets to Moses. The point here is that this refutes the Muslim apologist claim that heavenly kitab cannot be in physical form or that God himself cannot be the direct giver of kitab without any intermediaries. Now, where did the idea come from that the tablets were given by God directly from Moses? The Torah, or in Arabic, Taurat. Examining the case of the tablets is also intimately bound with examining the case of the Torah itself. The two are intimately intertwined. The idea that the tablets and Torah are physical kitab are all over the Bible. And not just that they are physical kitab, but that they physically existed during the lifetime of St. Moses. Consider the following from the Old Testament. Exodus 24.4 Quote, And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. End quote. Exodus 24, 7, quote, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. End quote. Exodus 24, 12, quote, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. End quote. Deuteronomy 4, 12 to 13. Quote, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone. End quote. Deuteronomy 5, 22, which is actually 5, 19 in the Masoretic text. Quote, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. End quote. Deuteronomy 9.10 Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. End quote. Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 5. Quote, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, 
and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made. And there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. End quote. 1 Kings 2.3 And keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. End quote. 1 Kings 8.9 Nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of the land of Egypt. End quote. 2 Kings 14.6 Quote, but the children of the murderers he did not execute, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, in which the Lord commanded, saying, Father shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall be put to death for his own sin. End quote. 2 Chronicles 23.18 Also Jehoiada appointed the oversight of the house of the Lord to the hand of the priests, the Levites whom David had assigned in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was established by David. End quote. 2 Chronicles 25.4 However, he did not execute their children, but did as it is written in the law in the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall die for his own sin. End quote. 2 Chronicles 34, 14 through 16. Quote, now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. End quote. Nehemiah 8.1, quote, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. End quote. Daniel 9.13, quote, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. End quote. Acts 15.21 quote, For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. End quote. 1 Corinthians 9.9 quote, For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? End quote. We even have Christ himself reading from physical kitab, namely from the prophets. Luke 4, 16 through 17 and 20 through 21. Quote, so he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. End quote. So it is indisputable that the tablets and Torah, as well as the later prophetic writings, were physical kitab. The tablets were given by God directly to Moses in physical form whereas the Torah was kitab given to Moses by revelation, which he then himself committed to physical form. Even the later prophetic kitab were written down. With respect to the gospel as kitab, 
we have evidence from the New Testament that Christ did indeed produce physical kitab. John 8, 2-12 Quote, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. End quote. Now, what was it that Christ wrote on the ground? Jeremiah 17.13 gives us the answer. Quote, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. End quote. In other words, Christ wrote down the names and sins of the accusers. This is physical kitab, in addition to oral kitab that we know Christ to have preached. It is also reminiscent of when Christ wrote the tablets with his finger that he then gave to Moses. By the tablets inscribed with his finger does Christ judge man. So too, by writing with his finger on the ground, does Christ judge man. The very notion of physical writing is inherent to Christianity. John 21, 25, quote, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. End quote. In addition to words, Christian iconography is also kitab. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Orthodox Christian tradition, it is proper custom that when referring to the production of icons, we do not say that they are painted, for they are not artwork. Rather, our tradition teaches us to say that icons are written, because icons are scripture. They are kitab. Consider the icon of Christ Pantocrator with scripture. It is a direct depiction of Matthew 5.17, that Christ is the fulfillment of what is written in Scripture, as denoted by the closed book. Quote, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. End quote. Being a fulfillment, the book is closed, and there are no more prophets to come after Christ. The Holy Spirit itself will be the one to guide the church. Now, there are some icons where Christ has an open book, and those icons are known as Christ the Teacher, which always has writings of the gospel message, namely what Christ preached. Those icons were never intended to be interpreted as if to say that another prophet was yet to come or that Christ is not the fulfillment of Scripture. Rather, those icons depict Christ's ministry of God himself in the flesh coming to teach us. Also consider the icon of the Transfiguration, which depicts St. Moses on the right with physical scripture representing the law, and St. Elijah on the left 
representing the prophets, all testifying of Christ. The three figures at the bottom are Peter, James, and John. This icon is Matthew 17, verses 1 through 3. Quote, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. End quote. Also consider the icon of St. Moses receiving the tablets directly from heaven, directly from Christ himself. This icon depicts Deuteronomy 9.10, quote, Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, end quote. We even have evidence from Muslim sources that Muhammad himself was not only familiar with Christian iconography, but that he personally went out of his way to preserve a physical icon of Christ with the Theotokos. Quote, In the hadith narrated from Abi Najih, from his father from Huwaitab bin Abdul Uzza and others apart from him, when it was the day of victory, i.e. the conquest of Mecca, the messenger of God, peace and blessings be upon him, entered the house, i.e. the Kaaba, and ordered a garment to be wet with water and the images blotted out therein. But he placed his palms on top of the image of Isa and his mother and said, Erase everything except what is underneath my hand. Narrated by Al-Azraqi. Now, here I put Ibn in brackets with a question mark because some sources have the narrator as Ibn Abi Najih and some as just Abi Najih. Furthermore, we have icons depicting Christ holding physical kitab that predate the advent of Islam. For example, the famous 6th century icon of Christ Pantocrator at St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula, and the 6th to 7th centuries icon of Christ with St. Menas in Bawit, Upper Egypt. Now, I'm not claiming that Muhammad saw these particular icons, but rather that these kinds of depictions of Christ, namely him holding a physical kitab, were part of Christian tradition in general that predate Muhammad, and that being exposed to icons in general, Muhammad would have seen these types of icons. These icons would reinforce the idea to Muhammad that Christ had a physical kitab, the Injil. But not just that. There is a hadith that explicitly demonstrates Muhammad was exposed to a written Injil. Quote, Narrated Aisha, the mother of the faithful believers, the commencement of the divine inspiration to Allah's messenger was in the form of good dreams which came true like bright daylight. And then the love of seclusion was bestowed upon him. He used to go in seclusion in the caves of Hira, where he used to worship Allah alone continuously for many days before his desire to see his family. He used to take with him the journey food for the stay and then come back to his wife Khadija to take his food likewise again till suddenly the truth descended upon him while he was in the cave of Hira. The angel came to him and asked him to read. The prophet replied, I do not know how to read. The prophet added, The angel caught me forcefully and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it any more. He then released me and again asked me to read, and I replied, I do not know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time till I could not bear it any more. He then released me and again asked me to read, but again I replied, I do not know how to read, or what shall I read? Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me, and then released me and said, Read in the name of your Lord, who has created all that exists, created man from a clot. Read, and your Lord is the most generous. And those are the first three verses of the 96th surah. Then Allah's messenger returned with inspiration and with his heart beating severely. Then he went to Khadija bin Huwailid and said, Cover me, cover me. 
They covered him till his fear was over, and after that he told her everything that had happened, and said, I fear that something may happen to me. Khadija replied, Never, by Allah. Allah will never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your kith and kin, help the poor and the destitute, serve your guests generously, and assist the deserving calamity afflicted ones. Khadija then accompanied him to her cousin, Waraka bin Naufal bin Asad bin Abdul Uzza, who, during the pre-Islamic period, became a Christian and used to write the writing with Hebrew letters. He would write from the Gospel in Hebrew as much as Allah wished him to write. He was an old man and had lost his eyesight. Khadija said to Waraka, Listen to the story of your nephew, O my cousin. Waraka asked, O my nephew, what have you seen? Allah's Messenger described whatever he had seen. Waraka said, This is the same one who keeps the secrets, Angel Gabriel, with whom Allah had sent to Moses. I wish I were young and could live up to the time when your people would turn you out. Allah's Messenger asked, Will they drive me out? Waraka replied in the affirmative and said, Anyone or man who came with something similar to what you have brought was treated with hostility. And if I should remain alive till the day when you will be turned out, then I would support you strongly. But after a few days, Waraka died, and the divine inspiration was also paused for a while. End quote. Consider also that the Quran plagiarizes the Bible. For example, the Gospel according to John, which is physical kitab. And this is just one example of plagiarism. There are others, but that's the topic of another video. We have the following from the Gospel according to John. Quote, then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. End quote. Now look at what we have in the Qur'an. Quote, That is because Allah is the truth and because he gives life to the dead and because he is over all things competent and that they may know that the hour is coming, no doubt about it, and that Allah will resurrect those in the graves. End quote. Sam Shamoon does a great job providing fuller context and really encapsulating what's going on here. The Bible teaches the Father, Son, Holy Spirit distinct persons who are inseparable from one another, who cannot act independently from one another, who do all things in perfect accord and unity. So the Father's doctrine is necessarily, the Son's doctrine is necessarily the Spirit's doctrine because they're not three separate beings who oppose one another. They're three persons who exist as one being who are inseparable. Now let me further prove that to you from John 5, 19 to 21. I'm gonna read this, but what I want you to do is open up your Quran. If you can, chapter I, uh, 22. It's electronic Quran. I don't, oh, but touch open it up. I don't touch it. I'm an infidel now, so okay. I, I don't touch it anymore. I want you to see. You're going to go to chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. Here's the proof, folks, of what I said from the Gospel of John itself. He's going to go to chapter 22, Surat al-Hajj, 6 to 7. I'm going to read John oh, 5. 6 to 7. Yeah. Now, All when right. you get to 6 to 7, don't read it yet. I'm going to read John 5, 19 to 21. F folks, follow with me. <clears throat> then answered Jesus and said unto them, Pay attention. Verily, verily, I send to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself. See, I can't act independently. I can't do anything on my own initiative. God is one. Yeah. But what He seeth the Father do, for what things soever He doeth, whatever the Father does, these also doeth the Son likewise. Notice what He just said. I can't do anything apart from the Father, but I can do whatever the Father does. There is no creature who can say, I can only do what God does, and I can't do anything besides doing what God does. 
Because a creature does a lot of things that God doesn't do. Creatures sin, God doesn't. And no creature can say, I can do whatever God does. So in this very passage where Jesus says, I cannot do a single thing on my own initiative, he goes on to complete the thought by saying, but whatever the Father does, I do it in the same manner that he does it. No creature can say that. Only one who's God Almighty can say that because it takes God to do the things that the Father does. Let me further prove it. 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and gives them life, quickeneth them, so the Son gives life, quickeneth whom he will. So like the Father gives life, I, like the Father, give life because I can do whatever the Father does and I can only do what the Father does. But the Father does things that only God can do, like give life, and yet the Son gives life as well. Hmm. But it gets better. John 5, 25, and that's where the crown's going to come in in a minute. Guys, pay attention to John 5, 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, the hour, the last day is coming, and now is <clears throat> when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Notice, the hour is coming, the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And because of the sound and power of his majestic voice, they will hear and live. But now it gets better. 28, 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. Pay attention. Hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Whose voice? The voice of the Son of God. And shall come forth. Did you see what Jesus said? Amen. By the sovereign power of his voice, at the hour when Jesus summons the dead, when the dead hear his voice, they will come out physically from their graves. The only way Jesus can raise the dead physically out of their graves by his voice is if he's all powerful. But notice he says he's going to do it at the last hour, at the last day, the day of judgment. And he also says, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. Now do me a favor, brother. Read chapter 22 of the Quran, verses 6 and 7. Notice what Jesus said. The hour is coming where I, by the power of my voice, will raise the dead from the graves at that hour. I, the Son of God, give life to the dead, and I am the truth and the life. Notice what the Quran says in 22, 6, and 7. 22, 6, and 7 is a classic example of copy and paste. Yep. Here's what it says. That is because God, Allah, basically, that is because Allah, He is the truth. And because He quickens, He basically brings the dead to life. And what does it say? Right? Yeah. And because He is able... To do all things. Now notice 7. In 7 it says, And because the hour is coming, no doubt of it, and God shall raise up whosoever is within the tombs. Okay, wait. Did you guys hear it? The Quran says, Allah is the truth. He quickeneth, gives life to the dead. And at the hour, Allah will give life to those in their graves. But Jesus said, He's the one who quickeneth the dead, gives life to the dead. And that at that hour, he, Jesus, by the sound of his voice, will raise the dead from their graves. So the Quran acknowledges that what Jesus said here in John proves that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father, inseparable from him, cannot act independently from him. What else do you want? So what do we have so far? Well, we know that the Quran was a physical kitab during the lifetime of Muhammad that was written by his scribe. The Torah was a physical kitab during the lifetime of St. Moses that he himself wrote. The tablets were a physical kitab during the lifetime of St. Moses and given to him directly from God. Muslim scholars recognize that kitab can come either directly from Allah in physical form or on the tongue of an angel. Christ read from a physical kitab. Christ wrote a physical kitab. Icons of Christ holding a physical kitab predate the advent of Islam. Muhammad was familiar with physical icons of Christ. Icons themselves are a form of physical kitab. Muhammad believed that the Torah and Gospel, or the Ingil or Injil, were physical kitab. Muhammad had access to a physical Ingil written in Hebrew script. Now remember, Ingil, or Injil, is a loan word based on Greek physical scripture, either from Greek Evangelion, Syriac Evangelion, or Ethiopic, or Ge'ez, Wangil. There are also native Syriac words to refer to the gospel, 
namely Bashira and Svarta, which the Arabic language could have appropriated as a kalk, given its Semitic affinity and the fact that there is plenty of evidence of Syriac Christian influence on the Qur'an. Yet Muhammad chose to appropriate the word Engil into Arabic as a foreign loan word ultimately related to Greek, whether from Greek directly or to the loan words in Syriac and or Ethiopic. And no amount of Muslim coping is going to get around the hard fact that Engil is a loan word into the Arabic language. The idea that Kitab in an Islamic context is completely and utterly dissociated from physical writing is absolute nonsense. It's as stupid as saying the earth is flat or that Muhammad was a prophet from the true God. Now we move on to see what the Quran itself says when it comes to previous kitab. In several places in the Quran, we are told that Moses was given kitab. For example, 253, 287, 6, 154, 11, 110, 17, 2, 23, 49, 25, 35, 28, 43, 32, 23, and 41, 45. We certainly gave Moses the scripture. Kitab in all these verses is consistently translated as scripture by Sahih International, which is a widely recognized and accepted English translation of the Quran. Other translations that also say scripture are, for example, Pekthal and Khan. Translations by Yusuf Ali, Shakir, Sarwar, and Arbery prefer the word book. But either way, as far as the Taurat is concerned, Muslims recognize that the kitab given to Moses is something physical. But now, in Surah 10, verse 94, it states, quote, So if you are in doubt, Shek, O Muhammad, about that which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, so never be among the doubters. End quote. Basically, Muhammad is doubting his prophethood. But Muslims will be very deceitful in their exegesis and claim that 1094 is using hypothetical language meant to prove a point that Allah is telling the Muslims not to be like the children of Israel. Muslims will say that this verse is not expressing Muhammad as being in doubt because supposedly Muhammad was never among the doubters. But this line of reasoning is nothing more than an unproved assertion biased in favor of those who believe in the truthfulness of Islam. Is God giving the scripture to Moses hypothetical? No. Is God making the Torah guidance for the children of Israel hypothetical? No. Is people reading the scriptures before Muhammad hypothetical? No. Is Muhammad being able to converse directly with the children of Israel, i.e. the Jews, hypothetical? No. God gave the kitab to Moses as guidance for the children of Israel, and this is the kitab that was being read by Jews since before the advent of Muhammad, and the Jews were a visibly identifiable group of people with whom Muhammad could interact. This is an undeniable reality. So then what else are we left with that this verse could be talking about? Muhammad doubting his own prophethood. In other words, Muhammad was doubting that the revelations he was receiving were truly from God. To assuage these doubts, he is told to go and verify the revelation he was receiving with that of what the Jews read, namely the Torah. And in so doing, he would find that what he is learning by revelation corresponds to what the Jews already have. This was to convince Muhammad that Firstly, the revelations he was receiving were indeed authentic because they matched up to previous kitab, especially since several verses of the Qur'an up to that point 
namely verses 71 through 93, were narrations about Noah, Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh, all of who can be corroborated in the Torah that the Jews read. And secondly, that Muhammad would find himself mentioned in the Torah. That's the immediate context. That's the exegesis that makes most sense. Putting forth the idea that the Qur'an establishes the various truths to only then present a hypothetical scenario that elaborates a non-realistic situation or portray a general admonition to the Muslims not to be like the Jews is not a reasonable exegesis of the immediate context. It's a manipulation of the data. In other words, we are free to reject the Muslim cope, especially because our explanation fits the data better. The narrative that Muhammad was in doubt and was told to go and verify with the Jews the revelations he was receiving in order that he convince himself that he was indeed a prophet is what makes the most contextual sense. It's what a logical person would conclude. But more than that, Satan can read. Satan is aware of previous revelations. Satan knows what is in the Torah. So Satan telling Muhammad to go verify his revelation with the Jews is Satan's deceit. This is the way Satan convinces Muhammad to believe that the revelations he is receiving are from God. But in reality, Muhammad's revelations are actually coming from Satan himself. Moreover, Satan is mimicking Christ when Christ told the Jews that they can find him, Christ, in the law and the prophets. Satan is parodying Christ by likewise telling Muhammad that he, Muhammad, can be found in the Torah and also the gospel. Now, Muslim tradition holds that Surah 5 is historically one of the last surahs to be revealed to Muhammad. This surah presents us with a clear picture of Muhammad's approach with regards to the Christians. Consider verses 46 and 47 from Surah 5. Quote, And we sent, following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah, and we gave him the gospel, in which was guidance and light, and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. And let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. End quote. Note that the statement in the English translation, quote, that which came before him, end quote, in the Arabic is literally, quote, that which is between his hands, end quote. In other words, a physical kitab. If Muslims take the Injil to be a physical kitab, then this gets them into the Injil dilemma, which I discuss in a separate video. You can find the link to that video in the description below. However, if Muslims want to claim that the Injil is not a physical kitab, then this gets them into an even bigger problem, because now the Qur'an would be admitting that the church as a body has accurately preserved the Injil orally. In other words, the Qur'an would then be legitimizing the church itself beyond just the kitab, known as Injil. Quite literally, the Qur'an would be legitimizing the church itself as kitab. What makes verse 47 so devastating to the Muslim polemic is that it is wholly unreasonable to task someone who has a corrupt kitab to judge according to that kitab and then blame them if they don't reach your desired outcome. 
if the Quran is to task Christians with using their own kitab in order to affirm the Quran and Muhammad, then by necessity, by necessity, the kitab they have cannot be corrupt in any sense of the word. The entirety of the kitab has to be perfectly preserved. And this is why the end of the verse calls those Christians disobedient who don't accept the Quran and Muhammad. In other words, the kitab the Christians have is not erroneous, but rather the people are being disobedient to the kitab that they already have. So if the Muslim wants to invoke the polemic that the Injil is not a physical kitab, then the only option left is to conclude that the kitab known as Injil is preserved orally by the church itself, which then means that having preserved it orally, they could transcribe it into a physical mushaf, which would be the Greek Evangelion, the Syriac Evangelion, or the Ethiopic Wangil. And other words, the Greek Evangelion and its Syriac and Ethiopic translations would indeed be faithful renditions of the Quranic Injil. This then puts us right back at square one that Muslims can't get around. Muslims are forced to conclude that the physical gospel accounts in Greek are indeed the Injil. But in doing so, that gets one into the Injil dilemma, namely that Christ never brought a Greek Injil. There's no way Muslims can get out of the loop without contradicting the Quran. If Muslims claim the Injil that Christ brought was not physical kitab, then verse 47, by necessity, must take the position that the church itself orally preserved the kitab of Christ. But if the church preserved it in oral form, then it can transcribe it in writing, thereby producing a physical kitab. But the physical kitab in Greek, Syriac, and Ethiopic is not the letter-for-letter -letter physical kitab that Christ brought. In other words, while the Greek, Syriac, and Ethiopic texts reflect the message of the kitab that Christ brought, they are not that message verbatim as Christ brought it. It would be like saying that an English translation of the Quran accurately reflects the meaning of the kitab given to Muhammad, but it's not the actual kitab given to Muhammad letter for letter. One cannot make the assertion that the English translation of the Qur'an in and of itself is the kitab letter for letter given to Muhammad, because it isn't, even though it may accurately convey its meaning. The only way for Muslims to get out of the loop is to deny that Christians preserved the kitab, both as a physical mushaf and as an orally functioning church. But then this contradicts the Qur'an because verse 47 would make no sense in tasking Christians with judging by the kitab in their possession because it is illogical to task someone who has corrupt kitab expecting to get favorable results. Now, the Muslim apologist might say that verse 47 is talking about some obscure or mythical group of Christians somewhere out there who really did faithfully preserve the gospel in contrast to the so-called corrupt Christianity you have of the Byzantines, the Orientals, the Nestorians, and so on. One thing to remember is that Muhammad interacted with real Christians at the time. The verse cannot be rhetorical to refer to some obscure or mythical group of Christians somewhere out there teaching the so-called real Quranic Injil. The Quranic Injil is the gospel of historical mainstream Christianity. And now this is where the next verse, verse 48, comes into play, which states the following. Quote, 
And we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, the book in truth, confirming that which preceded it of the scripture and as a criterion over it. So judge between them by what Allah has revealed and do not follow their inclinations away from what has come to you of the truth. To each of you we prescribed a law and a method. Had Allah willed, he would have made you one nation united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given you. So race to all that is good. To Allah is your return altogether, and he will then inform you concerning that over which you used to differ. End quote. In Hadith literature, there is discussion surrounding how the Adhan, i.e. the Islamic call to prayer, was introduced into Islam. In order to notify people that it was time for congregational prayer, it was suggested to use a bell like the Christians or a horn like the Jews, indicating that the Muslims were familiar with Christians and Jews in person. Now, Umar made the suggestion to have a man make the call to prayer using his voice, and Muhammad went with Umar's suggestion. The commentary to this hadith is very interesting as it addresses a much broader issue or principle of Quranic exegesis that is directly relevant for the preceding analysis of verses 47 and 48 from Surah 5. For completeness sake, the hadith reads as follows. Ibn Umar reported, when the Muslims came to Medina, they gathered and sought to know the time of prayer, but no one summoned them. One day they discussed the matter, and some of them said, use something like the bell of the Christians, and some of them said, use a horn like that of the Jews. Umar said, why may not a man be appointed who should call people to prayer? The Messenger of Allah said, O Bilal, get up and summon the people to prayer. End quote. Now, Imam Nawawi's commentary to this hadith is as follows. Quote, the hadith shows Umar's great merit as his suggestion was right on course. The hadith also makes clear that important matters should be decided after discussion and consultation. This is desirable for the Muslim community, according to the unanimous view of scholars. However, our scholars differ as to whether consultation was a duty binding on God's messenger, peace be upon him, or it was recommended to him, as it is to us. They maintain that the correct view is that it was binding on him. God says, quote, Pardon them and pray for them to be forgiven and consult with them in the conduct of public affairs. End quote. And here he's quoting Surah 3 verse 159. The majority of scholars are of the view that when something is stated in the imperative form, it signifies obligation. End quote. This last point about understanding the imperative to be an obligation is very crucial, as we see that in verse 48, there are imperatives for Muhammad to judge among the Christians and to not follow them. These imperatives following right on the heels of verse 47. So these verses of the Quran present Muhammad as interacting with historical Christianity. And since the charge in verse 47 a priori has to take as necessity that the Injil as Kitab was preserved by the Christians, we have Muhammad admitting that the church has indeed been authentically preserved. This is the most logical explanation of these verses. What Muhammad was expecting is that the church, represented by these Christians, would naturally recognize him as a prophet and embrace him. Remember, Satan deceived Muhammad when he told him to go to the Jews to verify the revelations being given to him. Muhammad was likewise being deceived by Satan in his dealings with Christians. This is why Muhammad said the Christians who rejected the Quran and him were disobedient. 
not that the church and Injil as Kitab were in error. Now, Muslims may try a desperate cope that verse 48 is actually talking about the Jews and not the Christians. This is not so. Consider what the scholar Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi writes in his An-Nur al-Mubin, which I have personally translated from the original Arabic since, to my knowledge, an English translation does not exist. Quote, that Jews and Christians from the people of the book, singular kitab, indeed altered their religion, changed it, and differed therein. They added to the books, plural kutub, of Allah and took away from them. End quote. One thing to immediately notice is that despite the usage of the plural kutub delineating distinct separate revelations, namely Torah and Gospel, both Jews and Christians are part of the singular Ahlal Kitab. So, reference to Kitab, i.e. the singular, in verse 48 of the Qur'an, lumps the Injil and Taurat together as simply Kitab that preceded Muhammad. This understanding is also especially reinforced given that the immediately preceding verse is explicitly addressing Christians and the Injil. Ultimately, what verse 48 is about is Muhammad establishing authority over the church because he supposedly stands in direct continuity of its tradition. In other words, Muhammad is the inheritor of the church. This is why verse 46 is especially important for understanding verse 48. In verse 46, Jesus is demonstrated to be the inheritor of the Jewish tradition and an authority over it. In like fashion, verse 48 is about Muhammad becoming the inheritor of Jesus and his church and authority over it, and by extension, inheritor of the Jewish tradition and authority over it. And verse 47, in between these two verses, sets this up by basically setting up the dichotomy that the Christians can either hand over the church to Muhammad willingly, or Muhammad will take the church by divine prophetic decree. Either way, the church now belongs to Muhammad. I want Christians to thoroughly grasp the arguments involving Surah 5, verses 46, 47, and 48. These three verses are hands down the most powerful verses that absolutely annihilate the Qur'an. They thoroughly demonstrate that the Qur'an takes an absolutely contradictory and illogical position, thereby forcing Muhammad to take by force, so to speak, the prophetic tradition when he fails to prove his case. In other words, Muhammad is a prophet on the sole grounds that he believes himself to be a prophet. And if you disagree with him, then he'll kill you. Now, it is to be expected that Muslims will disagree with my presentation. Nonetheless, let me point out the following. Muslims for the past 14 centuries, up to this very day, still dispute among themselves which hadiths and commentaries are authentic and inauthentic and to what extent. So any opinions that disagree with my presentation of the facts are really of no consequence. Muslim scholarship from its very inception alongside the advent of Islam right up to the present day has been a tradition of incessant infighting and bickering. It is an undeniable law of Islamic studies that Muslims will disagree with anything you say before you even say it. Non-Muslims are not bound to follow Usul al-Hadith methodology. For example, unlike the case for Muslims, 
we would say that whether or not someone was religiously devout does not inform us as to the truthfulness or accuracy of what that person narrates. A person can be a kafir and yet be more reliable in his narration than the most devout and pious Muslim who has a terrible memory. But a Muslim is a priori precluded from taking the narration of a kafir. We as non-Muslims are not bound by that restraint. Usul al-Hadith is more about manipulating sources in order to fabricate history according to one's liking in support of a particular narrative than it is about arriving at the truth. Think, for example, Sunni Hadiths versus Shia Hadiths. Both camps reject each other's Hadiths. The overwhelming vast majority of the plethora of disagreements within the Muslim community have nothing to do with Christianity. This is just infighting among Muslims that has always existed historically and persists to this very day. Each camp wants to write its own history and version of Islam. We as non-Muslims couldn't care less about Muslims anachronistically projecting current theological values back into the early days of Islam. As far as we're concerned, we see written historical evidence within Muslim sources in favor of the Christian position. We as non-Muslims are not bound to reject history or rewrite history because it contradicts a religiously motivated Muslim narrative. Muslims cannot use theology to control a historical reality supported by historical evidence. Muslims are all too happy to use modern Western textual criticism when attacking Christianity, but then argue for a privileged position, for example, usul al-Hadith, that has to adhere to Muslim standards when evaluating Muslim texts. What are the typical Muslim responses to expect? That Hadith is weak, or that Hadith is fabricated. Uh, we don't recognize that scholar, or that scholar was mistaken. Um, you've taken things out of context. That word doesn't really mean what everyone says it means. The Quran is easy to understand, except when it's not. Anything contradicting Islam is automatically untrue, because we know Islam has to be true. It all boils down to to Muslims basically advancing the position that Islamic scholars and Islamic scholarship are completely unreliable. When are you Muslims going to actually own up to something instead of just making up excuse after excuse after excuse when the integrity of Islam is threatened? You don't like your scholars, you don't like your tafsirs, you don't like your hadiths, whenever they can be used to disprove Islam. For a religion that is supposed to contain the final revelation for all of mankind, you Muslims make the religion of Islam to be the most unreliable with its sources, most disorganized in its presentation, and most unsubstantiated in its claims. Muslims, you can't keep playing the game that your hadiths are either daif or outright fabricated. You can't keep playing the game that you can be selective with your scholars. You can't keep playing the game that every word in the Quran has a gazillion different meanings when the obvious meaning that perfectly fits the context also happens to refute Islam. We don't care for your pseudo-intellectual excuses. 
whether it's at the street level at Speaker's Corner or couched in the ivory tower of so-called academia. Islam cannot withstand scrutiny. That's why Islam fosters a culture of killing anyone who criticizes it. At the end of the day, it is a fact that authentic kitab existed in physical form for Jews, Christians, and Muslims during the lifetime of Muhammad. Muhammad considered Jewish and Christian physical kitab to be authentic. Muhammad believed he was the inheritor of Jewish and Christian prophetic kitab. Jews and Christians rejected Muhammad because they recognized him as a fraud as a lunatic, an absolute garbage of a human being, nothing more than the tool of Satan used to propagate the demonic religion known as Islam. For the Qur'an to be such a clear revelation meant as guidance for all mankind, time and time again it is in fact presented by Muslims as being the most unclear, convoluted, and unintelligible book. When the Qur'an says that it is a clear revelation, then it means the average person should be able to understand the meanings of its words. Muhammad was not preaching to philosophers. He was preaching to simple, uneducated folk. Muslims attempt to act as gatekeepers to Muslim sources. These sources exhibit historical blunders damaging to the Muslim narrative. And so Muslims, by and large, want to take an anachronistic approach with them in accepting as authentic only those that conform to a reading favorable to Islam. The Muslim mindset is that Islam must be true, and so evaluation of historical evidence must treat Islam as holding a privileged position. As non-Muslims, we don't have to a priori give Islam such special treatment. The reality is that we have historical evidence from Muslims themselves that is damaging to the Muslim narrative. And Muslims have only themselves to blame for that. And they don't get to rewrite and manipulate history because their sources contain inconvenient truths. Today is history. Today will be remembered. Years from now, the young will ask with wonder about this day. Today is history, and you are part of it. 600 years ago, when elsewhere they were footing the blame for the Black Death, Casimir the Great, so-called, told the Jews they could come to Krakow. They came. They trundled their belongings into the city. They settled. They took hold. They prosper. In business, science, education, the arts. They came here with nothing. Nothing. And they flourished. For six centuries, there has been a Jewish cracker. Think about that. By this evening, Those six centuries are a rumor. They never happened. Today is history.